Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Peter Bergen, uh, Vice President of New America. Um, we've got two wonderful uh, guests uh, and experts to discuss the current situation in Afghanistan. Ambassador Roya Rahmani, who was um, US about the Afghan ambassador to the United States until July. Uh, she also served uh, in Indonesia as the Afghan ambassador there. Uh, she's had, she has degrees from McGill University in software engineering and, uh, and, and also a public administration from Columbia University graduate degree. Uh, has a long history working with NGOs uh, and is uh, <clears throat> coming uh, to us uh, from the Washington DC area. And we also have Candace Rondo, uh, who is a director of the Future Frontlines program at New America, uh, former Washington Post bureau chief in Kabul. Uh, Candace also worked for the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan uh, as a strategic advisor and lived in Kabul for uh, many years. Um, and both Candace and I are professors of practice at Arizona State University. Anyway, we're grateful for everybody who's uh, joining us. And I'm gonna start with uh, some first questions for Ambassador Rokmani and Candace will jump in as well. So Ambassador, uh, how are you feeling right now? Devastated. I'm very nervous, very worried and angry. Why angry? I am uh, I'm angry because of how all of this have been handled. I am, of course, first of all, angry because there has been a failure of international diplomacy in Afghanistan, that all our sacrifices and investments of 20 years have been really disregarded in the way things are evolving. Uh, but I'm also angry about how things are being managed right now. The chaos at the airport, the, the people who get left behind, who have been really the people who helped promote the vision uh, of United States and our allies, uh, those who uh, had connections and um, money and uh, affiliation got evacuated immediately. But so many people who really worked for a better Afghanistan, they are left behind, doomed to a, a faith that is completely uncertain and things are getting more difficult for them by the hour. Do it is a, a very difficult situation back on the ground. Do you have a sense of how many people help the United States or Britain or NATO or other allies? Do you, do you have a sense of the number of people we're talking about? Absolutely no idea. I first of all don't know. Uh, I mean, there has been announcement by countries, some saying I'm taking 20,000, some saying I'm taking 6,000, like variety of uh, numbers being thrown. But how many people uh, they are really taking and have taken out, I don't have any idea. Uh, it is going uh, pretty badly and pretty slow. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in terms of the numbers, who are trying to get out, I think it's massive. Do you um, have a reaction? I'm, I'm sure you saw President Biden's interview with George Stephanopoulos of ABC News. And essentially he said a number of statements and I'd like to get your reaction to them. One, that there was always gonna be chaos. It didn't matter when we left. Well, on one hand, I understand his position, like when he says that uh, it wouldn't have been different if, if he left now or in six months, if the circumstances have been the same as it was when they left, I, I agree with him. Yes, it wouldn't have made much of a difference if it was now or in six months under the very same circumstances. But if it was done differently, the outcome would have been different. This is, this is my viewpoint. Yes, if, if, if you continued, it would have been. And of course, there would have been some degree of chaos and uh, conflict and whatnot. But right now, it is like millions of Afghan people who are just thrown into this 
uncertain faith and, and the, a future that is just dominated by fear. What about the peace negotiations? Did they set the stage for this? The peace negotiations, uh, the, I, I'm, I'm um, assuming you are referring to the process that was in Doha. Yes. Uh, I think it was a complete failure. It uh, did not help with anything. Uh, it was a good opportunity for a much better uh, solution to be uh, brokered. I think it is a, of course, there was failure on part of the Afghan government as well as the international community because they did not really put all they could into that to make it a success. Uh, but at the same time, uh, of course, it, it did uh, embolden the Taliban, it gave them the diplomatic platform, it allowed them to uh, make the connection with the rest of the regional countries. Uh, but in terms of what it, uh, the result of it, we already have seen there was a military takeover. So what is the outcome of a peace process when one group is basically taking over uh, somehow militarily? Specifically excluding the Afghan government from those negotiations, was that a mistake? Of course it was. I mean, like you would negotiate uh, the fate of millions of people with a group that are not necessarily even in Afghanistan, except for fighting, except for conducting a military mission there and, and, and excluding uh, the Afghan people from that. What could have happened is that if international community uh, in a much more hands-on way provided a framework pressured all the, uh, all the sides, asked them to uh, agree on certain um, um, uh, conditions and uh, um, uh, basically terms uh, and, give, and give them deadline with the specific uh, consequences should they derail and do not agree. And then try to go in and enforce it. That would have resulted in, a, in a, probably a government that would have been more acceptable for everybody and would not have pushed hundreds of thousands of Afghans to gather at the airport today as they are. One final question before I turn to Candace. Um, General Milley said in a Pentagon briefing that there was no intelligence indicating that the collapse would take place in 11 days. Um, what's your view about the speed of the collapse and how predictable or unpredictable was it? Well, I'm, I, of course, was in no circle to receive any intelligence briefing, but what I have is the experience from the past. Having lived in, uh, under the circumstances as such, to me, it was totally not a surprise, especially like uh, the way it, it was happening over, over the past several weeks when the provinces were handed over to the Taliban without any resistance. And, and we were told that the ANDSF was ordered not to uh, resist, not to defend, to surrender. Then of course it was, uh, it was very clear. There was no surprise about it that how fast it happened. One, Kind of quick follow-up you were born in 1978 mm -hmm. uh, which is when the civil war began even before the soviets invaded so you've spent your entire life uh, living in a country at war representing a country at war what is what does the future look like now i am very worried and concerned i i am looking for a miracle and magic that that would turn things around but honestly these miracles and magic do exist it is just more consistency, more attention, and uh, more patience in terms of the international community. Like you said, I was born right a, a year, just a year before the Soviet invasion, and I have seen the country uh, collapse many times, and all my life have been in conflict. Uh, but 
there, there are ways. The problem is that here, when uh, or or in the rest of the world, when things like this happen, you it's a failure of policy. It's a failure of uh, what happens. Uh, the reporting was not right, or they could not predict it, and things like uh, what the intelligence community say here. But for Afghans, it means they lose lives, they lose limbs, they lose their households. This is, is not just a, a simple report that, that misled people. It is their entire course of life gets changed. And it's happening over and over. It is going on for over 40 years, almost like half a century. How much more? How many times again we are going to be facing this? And what is the consequence of this? All these people who are suffering to the extent that they are under a culture of war and conflict, this would have consequences for the rest of the world, for the stability of the region, for how the, the, this uh, power game in the world will be shaped and influenced. For people in the audience, if you want to submit questions, go ahead and submit them in the Q&A function and we'll sort of take them as we go. Candice, so um, you lived in Afghanistan at a time when it, uh, when it was more stable. How do you see what's happening now? Um, is the Taliban reformed, unreformed? Um, what, is the, what do the next weeks and months look like, do you think? Oh, thanks, Peter. I, you know, I lived in Afghanistan for almost five years. I've been, you know, working on um, supporting, you know, better understanding of the conflict there for 13 years. Um, I think anybody, you know, uh, including Ambassador Rahmani, who understands and has lived in Afghanistan, um, well understood that this was a predictable outcome absent um, the United States getting out of its own way. Uh, I think, you know, as early as 2011, um, when Obama first indicated that there would be a, the beginning of the drawdown in 2014, it was evident that what was needed was not necessarily a US-led negotiation process with the Taliban, but rather uh, a negotiation process led by a third party, preferably uh, the United Nations, um, with enormous amount of support that didn't happen. Uh, that is the fatal flaw here more than anything else. Um, and not of course, envisioning um, what the exit would look like all the way to the end. Um, in terms of the Taliban, I, I think we already see the evidence playing out uh, in these scenes of you know, shooting into crowds in Asadabad and Jalalabad, um, you know, while they're talking about giving amnesty to uh, former Afghan government officials uh, and anybody else who kind of worked for uh, a different vision of Afghanistan than, than the Taliban had. Um, clearly their rhetoric does not match their actions. The words and deeds uh, you know, are completely at opposition to each other. And that's nothing new. Um, we've seen that for years from the Taliban. Uh, and, I, and it speaks volumes um, about the discipline within their ranks uh, let's remember that, you know, thousands of uh, prisoners have been released uh, as, a, as a result of this process, many of them held for years, uh, you know, in, in Afghan government prisons uh, and in, in other kinds of custody. And they are now joining the ranks of the Taliban, um, and, you know, and so these folks are going to be far less disciplined uh, than perhaps uh, the core cadre uh, of the Taliban uh, organization and movement. And that's concerning. Uh, as as uh, Ambassador Rahmani just noted, um, the situation right now on the ground in Kabul in terms of the airlift effort is an unmitigated disaster, a national embarrass embarrassment for the United States, a stain on the history of this country uh, that we will never live down. Uh, until um, the Pentagon and the State Department start talking to each other and coordinating and opening those gates, uh, getting commanders on the ground to get those young Marines to open the gates and make sure people can get through without harassment um, and get on planes. There should be no planes leaving Afghanistan right now with empty seats, but there are. Um, so uh, unfortunately, the future of Afghanistan um, looks like more of this, but worse. And I, I have one more important piece here that we're not talking about. Um, which is there today, uh, Ahmed Massoud, the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud, 
uh, of course, the great Northern Alliance fighter um, who fought the Taliban for many years, had an, an op-ed in the Washington Post um, calling for resistance. And you know, this is this is an old story in Afghanistan that anybody knows. Um, when when there is a collapse, uh, young men go to the mountains. They say, right? Um, and so we will now once again have a redoubt in the Panjshir Mountains, uh, a pocket of resistance. Uh, and the Taliban, uh, of course, have an enormous amount of power at this moment, but there's no reason to believe that they will have the kind of staying power uh, that they had just even a week ago. Um, I, I predict that we will start seeing all kinds of resistance. Some of it will be peaceful. Uh, some of it will be vi violent. And you know, the regional partners and players, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, uh, India, all of them are going to pay the price for their schadenfreude. Um, all of them are going to pay a price for their inability to uh, come to the table and press all the combatants and all the members who are part of the hostilities in Afghanistan for a negotiated settlement um, to the end to this conflict. Well, that raises a good question for Ambassador Rahmani, uh, which is, you know, Ambassador, you know that um, for the Vice President Saleh, who of course was elected, uh, has said he's the caretaker president, and he's sort of identified himself as part of the resistance, the resistance that Candace is talking about, Ahmed Shah Massoud's son is organizing militias in the Panjir Valley as we speak. The Panjir, of course, was never taken by the Soviets or the Taliban. Um, how effective do you think that resistance will be, or is it just simply hard to tell right now? It's hard for me to speak to this because if all the time, whether you were talking about a resistance, a militia group, an insurgent, a, a weak uh, central government and whatnot, for somebody like me, it means one thing, continuation of conflict more people dying, economy not functioning, justice non-existence. So this is, I cannot say whether they would be effective or not, but I would like to draw your attention to something else. In Afghanistan, any group who wants to impose their ideology, to be one-sided, not to be inclusive, they will be faced with resistance. This has happened over and over. So if the Taliban are going to really um, uh, make a inclusive government uh, that would be respectful of the diversity of Afghanistan, that would be reflective of the aspiration of the people of Afghanistan, that would not take the opportunities uh, that they had, plus they preserve the gains they had, then hopefully we could be set uh, to somewhat the right course. Now, I'm not so sure if how I, that is going to happen with a very authoritarian, uh, narrow worldview that uh, basically sounds like my way or the highway. So uh, it is actually ju just just starting with the women. If if the world if their worldview continues to be that women uh, are only able uh, to get education to certain level or work in certain uh, sectors and, and nothing else, because this is their understanding of the religion, and how everybody has to abide by that and live like that, that is intolerable. There would be resistance, like Candace said. So there is, there is no question about that. Now, here is, here is the problem. The problem is how all of this is going to be managed. The, the issue is right now, the very um, uh, little uh, sense of uh, security in a sense that people are not getting killed in mass numbers. Is, I'm not sure it is going to be guaranteed or continue over the next weeks and months. Once the Taliban are trying to form their government and their people with dispersed uh, all around the country and all those, uh, the, the, the people that they believe will infiltrate, are they really able to govern the country? Uh, 
I was hearing today from the news that they are appointing a lot of uh, religious experts to run cities. This is by itself questionable. And then uh, getting all the women out of the equation, that, that's going to be very complicated. And the resistance, I'm one way or another, to something like that will be formed, whether it is uh, uh, Vice President Saleh or uh, the late uh, uh, Commander Sun or, or uh, other groups. I'm, I'm, I'm aware that they are not the only one. Uh, they are more vocal, but uh, there are many other groups who are already thinking about this and reaching out. So the result of it would be chaos and civil war. Let me ask you, you were the first woman to be appointed ambassador to the United States uh, by the Afghan government. Will the Taliban controlled government be sending women ambassadors to the United States or anywhere else? Based on their uh, statements so far, it, it does not sound very promising because they have made a statement that women can go back to their work and they can carry on whatever they were doing with the caveat that within the Islamic Sharia, and uh, Afghan women already and uh, Afghan people already believe that they were already complying, com complying with the Islamic Sharia. But then if it is a very specific version uh, of that uh, with a uh, very specific interpretation of this is my understanding of that and now you have to abide by that and nothing else is tolerable, I don't think that there is any hope to believe that. One quick follow up there. So their understanding of Islamic Sharia is a huge caveat. And it means that, uh, to correct me if I'm wrong, but women might be able to work as doctors treating only female patients, or women might be allowed to work as teachers only teaching girls. Is that is that what you think it might happen? This, uh, yes. The, I mean, in the in the past, when they were in power during the 90s, they weren't even open to that. And it seems like over the past 20 years and recognition of how Afghanistan has moved on, they have come to realize that, okay, so they need to study because they need to treat other women. And then, but I don't, so far, it doesn't seem that it would be any different. Let me turn to some questions and Candice, feel, feel free to answer this one. Um, didn't the Pentagon have 18 months to plan for this? What happened? Oh, I mean, let's talk about that actually. So the Pentagon um, is not the only uh, player at the table when it comes to um, you know the wind down of uh, a major diplomatic and uh, military engagement in another country. And in this instance, you have the State Department, you have the Pentagon, and you have the U.S. Agency for International Development. All three of whom need to coordinate uh, in order to anticipate. Uh, the kind of refugee flows that you would expect to be coming out of Afghanistan? Um, no, the answer is no, uh, because in fact, uh, you know, I, I think we we might remember that under the Trump administration, um, there was, of course, a lot of resistance inside the Pentagon um, to the way the deal was being negotiated, uh, and and rightly so, <laughs> because it clearly did not anticipate. Um, all the different contingencies that we're seeing start to play out now. Um, and, you know, more importantly, uh, you know, without pointing too many fingers, the, you know, the chief special envoy, Zal Mehul um, I think was never given truly the remit uh, that he probably would have needed to start thinking about um, what it would look like should the Afghan government disintegrate. And we will note the personal relationship uh, with Zamil, Zamil Khalilzad and Ashraf Ghani that goes back many, many years, um, uh, that is very complicated, in fact. Uh, and I think there are personalities here at work that made it very difficult. So I just speak to the personalities issue and the politics just internally as a, as a barrier um, to planning ahead. But once um, the Biden administration took office, uh, and, and more importantly, once they made the decision to move up the timeline to August 31st, as opposed to September 11th, um, already that was another sort of fatal flaw. Uh, and what was not apparently anticipated was that, you know, that would cause the government to collapse, um, that, the, that the actual naming of the date and the changing of the date would have a psychological effect. But it's exactly that two week window 
in which we have this kind of unraveling happening. So clearly the planning wasn't there. Uh, and, and clearly the coordination between the State Department and the Pentagon uh, is very weak. And, you know, I'm aware, for instance, that there's a task force at the State Department right now of roughly 20 odd, 20, 25 people. They're scrambling, they're doing their best. Um, but in the meantime, it is not clear what kind of conversation is being had between the Pentagon uh, and that task force, which is responsible for the exfiltration, you know, of thousands of Afghans. Um, you asked earlier, Peter, about, you know, how many, how many Afghans um, you know, will have worked with different countries, uh, you know, to, for a different vision of Afghanistan than the Taliban have. Um, I think the answer is probably in the hundreds of thousands, if not potentially more than a million or two. Uh, when you really think about it, uh, Afghanistan is a country of 35 million people, uh, and NATO is a coalition of 28 nations. And every single one of those nations had both diplomatic and military representation in the country. Uh, and every single one of them had, therefore, Afghan nationals working with them or for them directly. Um, and then you think about all of the different aid organizations, um, uh, civil society support organizations like my own, the International Crisis Group uh, that I worked with for many years. Um, all of us had people in the country that we worked very closely with um, who are now at risk. Um, and that contingency simply clearly was not planned for at all, not by uh, the Biden administration, not by the Trump administration, which clearly uh, was very pronounced and in its anti-Muslim uh, view of the world, uh, and not by any previous administration. And it's a, you know, as I say, an unmitigated catastrophe. Now, let me let me turn then to um, the situation at the airport. We have a question from Rachel Reed, who has worked on Afghanistan for for many many years, um, and she asked a good question. Um, essentially, you know, is there a role for the UN at the airport? So so it's not just sort of America first because vulnerable Afghans aren't getting on to the airport. Um, and then a kind of related question from an anonymous uh, attendee, which is uh, directed at you, Candace, which is, uh, are you advocating further military action with the Marines to overturn Taliban checkpoints in Kabul to allow asylum seekers and citizens onto the airfield? Um, well, certainly there would be a, U, a, a UN role here implicated. And in fact, that, that would have been one um, potential planning point that could have been um, put in place, I think, months ago. Uh, and, and I would say that, you know, uh, Antonio Gutierrez really has now, I think, an obligation, if, you know, if anybody's listening out there, um, to, to move swiftly to see what can be done within the Security Council um, to ensure that the corridor is protected. Um, if, if it's possible um, to get that corridor protected by UN peacekeeping troops, that would be fantastic, I think, personally. Um, and I agree that the, you know, having the US le lean forward uh, is a potentially a very risky position. I'm certain that's why there's so much hesitation inside the Pentagon. Um, in the immediate term, in terms of uh, what I'm advocating, and I think probably others are advocating right now, um, you know, we're hearing stories about the Taliban shaking people down for money as they try and approach the entryway, uh, the roadway up to the, the airport right now. Um, and, you know, stripping them of the papers that they do have, whatever precious little um, evidence they do have that they have, you know, the right to kind of approach the airport in the first place. Um, that has to stop. And I know it's going to be difficult, um, but that's, that is where the UN, I think, probably could be very useful. Um, I certainly think that uh, the U.S. should be working very hard with its allies in, in NATO, uh, in the coalition, to push back that perimeter, um, meaning making sure that there's greater, um, at least some sort of greater control um, to allow for uh, the entry of, of Afghans um, at least two, three, four hundred meters out from the entryway to the airport. Um, and I, I will say this right now. If the Pentagon is not moving to get the commander on the ground uh, at Kabul International Airport, Hamid Karzai International Airport, um, to get eyes on at the gate, that commander needs to physically walk to the gate right now and assess the situation and get a solution in place. Is the UN part of that solution, Ambassador Rekmani? Um, I echo what Candace said. Uh, I would 
just just uh, being realistic, I'm not sure that at this point, trying to get consensus on what to do on Afghanistan at the UN level and the bureaucracies that they are going through would be a very fast solution. However, I agree with her that if there was an urgent action and some peacekeeping uh, troops would be deployed immediately, like if they could really move that immediately, that would be a very good solution, number one. Number two, if not, like uh, Candace said, there is need for immediate action. It is chaos because people are panicked, people are taking their chances, everybody has been called to the airport and organizing it is difficult, but it's not rocket science. So you really need to get somebody down on the ground to uh, sort people out, tell who should go home, who should stay, and what is the order. Right now, the people who are getting calls that they will be evacuated, they, they spend days at the airport before they get evacuated. And they don't even know whether they would be evacuated or not. I am aware of play, uh, like some, some people that I, I know closely uh, have been evacuated and two, three times because the plane wasn't sure where to go. Once they were in the plane, the plane left and, and landed in one of the neighboring countries. Then they were turned back. Then they came back to Kabul and they were supposed, while they were supposed to go to a different country, uh, um, Eastern Europe, and then they came back again. So three times they had this back and forth before they finally landed to where they were intended to land. And um, we were just having a side uh, discussion before this uh, conversation started and Candice was telling me that because of this chaos, there are planes that are coming back with empty seats. So uh, this is the level of this array that we are talking about. I think it is time that, like Candace said, that the commander goes down on the ground and organizes things because it is going to get only more and more difficult moving forward. A question for both of you from Tom Freston, who's a New America board member who spent many years living in Afghanistan and also <clears throat> ran MTV and Viacom and also was uh, has played an important role in advising Tolo TV, which of course is the main independent source of news in, in Afghanistan. His question is, do you have a sense of how the Taliban will seek to deal with current independent media sector, TV, radio, print, social media, internet access, et cetera? Is their current more tolerant pose just temporary? 100%, what is, what is the tolerant pose? I mean, they've been targeting journalists left and right, killing them. <laughs> I don't see any tolerance, right? Um, I, think, I, I think the floodgates are now open for an all out campaign. Uh, especially for the most independent Afghan voices, but I'll de defer to Ambassador Rahmani. Um, I, I agree with you. They already made an announcement of how they are going to be dealing with media with three uh, conditions. Um, two of them uh, could be interpreted uh, however you would possibly uh, can and given the Taliban's record, I think it wouldn't be very difficult for them to interpret it in a very harsh way, saying that uh, the journalists could do whatever uh, the, the reporting uh, in an impartial way, in a professional way, uh, but in accordance to Sharia. So they always le leave that caveat. I mean, um, who is reporting against the Sharia? What what does that? even mean, uh, really, uh, clearly speaking, as a Muslim and as somebody who has worked on Islamic laws, I, I wonder what, what does that even mean? Um, secondly, uh, they say, uh, we want to make sure that it is not um, against the national interest. Uh, again, uh, you say there is a free media, independent media, and then you cannot uh, speak against the national interest. And how you interpret that national interest is another thing. So with the Taliban and their uh, view, uh, the way they are conducting themselves, the whole thing is uh, that they really use fear as, as an uh, instrument of control. Uh, and many, many people are joining that. They, I am sure that people uh, will not be reporting necessarily independently for long uh, because of fearing for their own lives and their family's life. 
as uh, to your question regarding the, the means of connections, internet and whatnot, uh, that's, a, that's another concern because once uh, there is a problem with the infrastructure, for example, lack of electricity, which people are all, have been already facing, then it could become even more difficult. Or if they decide to ban certain applications, uh, which is a means for people to connect to the uh, outside world, then they will be, Afghanistan will be completely isolated, completely disconnected into this black hole. For, for both of you, starting with Ambassador Rachmani um, from Abdulaziz Waheli, how do you explain the collapse of the Afghan army, the lack of resistance to the Taliban? I thought the military could be the one institution that can lift the nation to stand on, on its own for a better future. My understanding is that the uh, collapse of the military was due to the uh, lack of leadership from Kabul. Uh, they failed to support the military. They failed to provide them with morale and, and uh, to fight. They failed to lead them. In fact, uh, it has been uh, many of the commanders uh, from the field uh, shared that they were ordered not to fight. They were ordered to surrender. And as a result, they did. And, and as uh, we progressed, uh, as, as the time progressed uh, in the uh, theater, uh, we had announcement by the governors saying, we peacefully handed over the provincial capital to the Taliban. And if, if you do that, then how could possibly the military fight? The, the failure in their part was because of lack of leadership and lack of support. Well, I, agree, I agree with that as well. I mean, I, I, I wanna talk about the mechanics though of what lack of leadership looks like, um, because I think that's kind of, it's a little bit abstract sometimes when we talk about what it means to have a failure of leadership in a military context. But in Afghanistan, you know, you have a very large military and a huge investment, hundreds of thousands of troops um, but, you know, the logistics chain, literally for getting, you know, ammunition, food, uh, uniforms, uh, medical supplies, uh, you name it, um, the, the, the logistical chain was al always broken at best, um, A, because the, the terrain is very difficult to navigate, um, and, um, but also because even when supplies would reach, let's say, a given base. It could be in Kandahar, it could be in Helmand, it could be anywhere in Afghanistan. Um, it doesn't mean that the commander in charge of that base is doing his or her best, his best often, right, um, to ensure that the supplies are properly used. There's a lot of hoarding uh, of materials, uh, a lot of reselling of materials on the black market, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of failure to manage the military material uh, that was actually given to them. And, and that was a perennial problem. That's not like yesterday's problem. It's a problem from that's been going on for 20 years. Um, if, you if you compound that with the fact that the, the loss of air resources, uh, not just airstrikes, I'm talking about, again, medevac for soldiers who are left on the battlefield, you know, taking things to and from places, um, once the United States began to draw itself down and reduce um, its air presence and its operations, that meant for the Afghan forces uh, that they would have to step up. Uh, and, they, and they had never been asked to step up. Uh, in fact, it was sort of like step up overnight, right? Um, and, you know, I, 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 when I was there, you know, I spent a lot of time with Afghan soldiers uh, and police as well. Uh, and it was, you know, they lived in miserable conditions, uh, and, you know, eating rotten food uh, and unable to, uh, you know, uh, bring their troops to safety once they were, you know, if they were wounded or harmed or even bury them. I once, one of my last days in Afghanistan uh, was to the Kabul Military Hospital, which also contains the morgue for, uh, you know, Afghan soldiers. Um, I saw bodies stacked high, okay, literally, in the morgue itself, but then shipping containers full of bodies uh, that were rotting in the sun, uh, left unclaimed um, because either their families were afraid to claim them because they feared retribution from the Taliban um, or because the government failed to notify families 
because it was so inept and incompetent. We haven't talked nearly enough about the failure uh, of, of competency uh, in the presidential palace at the ARG in Kabul. Ambassador Rahmani, tell us how many Afghan soldiers have been killed or wounded because there's sort of a narrative that they just folded, but I, that's not exactly uh, as Candace indicates, um, there's a there's a part of the story that's missing right now. Absolutely. And every single day when I wake up, I think about them and their families. And I wonder that many of them, why, why they lost their lives, why they lost their limbs. Uh, the number that we know about is uh, over 70,000. They are killed, uh, millions injured. Yeah. And then just think about the impact of it, long-term impact of it. As many of those people, those soldiers have been the breadwinners of their homes. They have left many children, their wives with absolutely nothing and no support system, dying for the country that now is basically uh, their, their very institution is now the one that gets a lot of blame for not defending the country while they were just left out dry uh, the way Candace just explained. Question from Ambassador Indifer, who, as you both know, played in, <clears throat> uh, he was the top uh, State Department uh, official on South Asia um, in, during the, the Bill Clinton administration, amongst other things. Um, his question is about Pakistan. Pakistan hasn't recognized the Taliban yet, unlike their previous recognition of the Taliban. What role do you think Pakistan will now play? What role do you think they should play? And by the way, and I'll add, is this kind of a double-edged sword for them? Because, you know, maybe they, the Taliban completely taking over has some problematic aspects for them. After all, the Pakistani Taliban, much of which is now in Afghanistan, has killed you know tens of thousands of Pakistani civilians and soldiers. So, to both of you, Pakistan will they recognize the Taliban? Uh, is this something that they kind of may this can this blow back on them? I I would say that as the other re, uh, Pakistan probably is holding because there is already hope that they would not be alone or anymore. Other regional countries would step forward and recognize them, and they would come along and recognize them too. It is just a matter of time. Also, it's a matter of time to see how things will unfold. Right now, Taliban should. Uh, there is nothing to recognize. They haven't established a government. They haven't announced their new government, in fact, to be recognized or not recognized. Uh, but then whether they uh, could play a constructive ro role or what should they do is something that we have been talking about for the past 20 years, uh, at least 20 years, I would say. Um, but it has never necessarily mat materialized. Do they have an edge regarding the Pakistani Taliban and how would that uh, play for them? Um, I think uh, it is it is a, a good reason. Uh, it gives them like a kind of uh, ammunition to talk about and justify why they have to be very good with the Taliban. But there is also another fact. Uh, uh, Pakistan have been very good in managing Taliban. Uh, they have managed them. Uh, they managed them during the 1990s. They managed them before that. And, and over the past 20 years, with their leadership being housed there, with the Pakistan uh, speaking for them and, and uh, leading them, uh, they have been very good in managing. So I would think that Pakistan should not be too worried about how the Afghan Taliban uh, would possibly go against them uh, in any possible way, including by supporting the Pakistani Taliban. And yeah, I would agree. I totally agree with that assessment. I mean, I think, uh, you know, speaking to sort of the Pakistan Taliban relationship, it's it's important to understand um, there's a lot of wealth, Taliban wealth, you know, in Karachi, in Quetta, uh, in other parts, Peshawar, right, that is just there, um, completely protected. And it's wealth that has been jointly raised 
between the Taliban and their sponsors in the uh, ISI, the Pakistani Intelligence Services. Um, so we have to be clear about the relationship. That is uh, an unbra uh, seemingly unbreakable bond uh, between the two. Uh, and I think Ambassador Rahmani's uh, you know, assessment that the Pakistanis have managed to that relationship well and will probably continue to do so is, is spot on. Um, in terms of recognition of the Taliban though, um, you know, while we're hearing from Imran Khan, of course, uh, the head of uh, Pakistan's government, uh, you know, that this is this marks a moment of the you know release of Afghanistan from slavery, uh, which I think is tomfoolery um, personally. But um, you know, if, if anything, it's actually driving them you know back deeper into slavery. Um, it will cause enormous amounts of strain uh, economically on the country. But nonetheless, um, despite that rhetoric. I, I think Pakistan understands that it's not its turn to go first and recognize the Taliban, uh, that that may have consequences diplomatically. Um, uh, you know, Iran may be tempted, but again, I think there are reasons why internally its constituencies uh, may not be, you know, have much of an appetite for that fight. Um, I would, if I was taking a bet, uh, the first to recognize the, the Taliban government, if there ever is a government that actually fully forms, will probably be Russia and China. Uh, Masa, you agree? Yes. Um, just to clarify something you said earlier, we're getting a question about it. Um, when you said that some of the Afghan forces were ordered to surrender, um, can you clarify kind of what, was that because there was a theory that we should just abandon some certain of the more obscure districts and try and focus on the cities and, or what, what, what do you, what do you say, who ordered Afghan military forces to stand down and why? Well, I'm hearing a variety of different uh, theories and actually um, narratives of what happened. I, I and I will uh, try to briefly recount them. Yes, one is the one that uh, at the very initial stage, uh, as the Taliban made uh, speedy progress in uh, in gaining territory around the uh, districts, it was a sensible military tactic too, to just stand down and leave the districts, uh, leave territory focus on the centers of population. That was a military tactic and that was a sensible thing. And this is what happened. They, to they told them to pull back so that we can. In fact, I'm also hearing that even that did not happen well enough in time. We already lost a lot of soldiers in, in a lot of checkpoints that were isolated, that were not supported. They did not get the support that they, they needed in time, and we just lost them. That proposal was very uh, early on on the table. As soon as President Biden announced that there would be a full withdrawal, it was anticipated, and it was a strategy, but even that was implemented late after we lost a lot of soldiers, number one. Then second, then comes the next phase. The next phase was that the concentration was at the centers of population. Now, depending on what, where those centers of populations were located, what I have heard is that uh, in uh, certain places, they were just left dry. They needed support and they did not get the support. They, they, and, and that resulted in loss of lives, number one. Number two, when that happened, and a lot of the uh, forces saw that, they witnessed that they were fighting for a system that did not respect them and support them, uh, they also were demoralized and they pulled back. This, ha this did happen. Uh, and, and then comes the other phase where things are at the level of the uh, provincial capitals. And this is, this is the most questionable one. And I do not necessarily know the answer why, but there are different discussions and, and theories that I have heard, I cannot confirm or reject any of them, that uh, the uh, commanders, the governors were ordered to leave the cap uh, provincial capitals and surrender to the Taliban. Now, as why? Uh, that happened. There are a variety of different narratives. Uh, to just recount, uh, some major one is uh, one is that they knew that they cannot resist and there would be a takeover in order to prevent the more killing of the people. That happened. The second one is that there was a side deal 
between the Taliban and former Afghan government that it would happen and then um, they would make sure that there is there is uh, a peaceful kind of surrender to the Taliban. The third is that that uh, people disseminate that it was uh, the Americans and the international community who had direct access to the Afghan military and they know the, their uh, structure and formulation. They told them not to fight. But when it comes to the ca provincial capital and the, and the officials went public to the media saying that we peacefully surrender the capital that could not could not have happened without getting direct uh, direction from policy. Yeah, I, I would also just, I mean, I, you know, not hearing everything, you know, there are lots of theories of the case, I'm sure. Um, but I can, you know, I can imagine a situation, um, knowing what we know about Afghanistan and how provincial capitals, um, especially ones that are very remote uh, and are less uh, economically central to the to the country's kind of viability, um, you know, there, you know, I can imagine that there were always side deals in place with the Taliban um, between uh, members of the military and members of the provincial government, um, because you just you would have had to make those deals to get goods and services through. Um, throughout the, the war. Uh, that's just a reality. Um, and we know for a fact that the Taliban was constantly imposing taxes, you know, in, in some of these more ro remote locations, right, uh, on everything from the movement of, you know, fruit in and out of major provincial capitals, you know, and, and then down to, to Kabul, right, uh, or other major cities in Afghanistan. So I can imagine a situation in which um, those deals were already in place. And it was just sort of a question of, you know, what was the tipping point um, in that relationship, which is probably pretty personal, actually, uh, where essentially uh, it was decided it was time to leave. Uh, and, and most of that probably had to do with personal decisions about, you know, to protect their own lives, but also their own wealth, first and foremost. There's a lot of money leaving Afghanistan now, uh, you know, in, in the personal pockets of a lot of people um, mm -hmm. who really, um, you know, were extremely corrupt. And so that kind of corruption is just so corrosive uh, and, uh, you know, whether or not there was a direct order from the ARG, um, you know, I think we could probably point some fingers. Uh, you know, I think we, we know about the triumvirate, you know, those who are close to Tagani who might have been um, confused about what, what giving orders was really about. Um, but we also know that in the Afghan military itself at the higher level in the officer corps, uh, that there are, you know, there are three or four different factions. They're very ethnically, you know, sort of divided. Um, and, you know, the, the current, well, I don't really know what to say anymore, but the, the now, the most recently uh, appointed head uh, of the Afghan military, the Minister of Defense, Bismillah Khan, um, was, you know, he's a very controversial figure, um, but he, you know, uh, he represents one faction. And these factions were warring with each other. So I, I don't, envision this as a situation where there was a single order coming out of the ARG, out of the palace in, in Kabul, but rather a series of lots of different suborders, um, you know, at the provincial capital level, uh, and then, you know, deals um, and even, you know, factional infighting inside the Ministry of Defense that led to this disaster. Question from Abdul Aziz Wahili. Which country do you think has the most leverage over the Taliban, Qatar, UAE, the Saudis? And I'll add, you know, it was interesting, I, the pictures of Mullah Barader getting off Qatari military transport plane when he arrived uh, back in the political leader of the Taliban when he came back for the first time in 20 years to, to Afghanistan. And, you know, obviously Saudis and the Emiratis recognized Afghanistan, the Taliban, pre 9-11, uh, there's been a lot of changes. MBS has outlawed the Muslim Brotherhood, for instance, in, in Saudi Arabia, labeled it a terrorist organization. So do you think the Saudis and the Emiratis, um, I mean, are, are they unlikely to recognize the Taliban? What's their relationship going to be? And what role will Qatar play uh, going forward? I would say that uh, the country that has the most leverage is, of course, Pakistan, number one. And then when you go uh, beyond that, uh, Qatar have been hosting them, housing them, supporting and providing, and that, that gives them a channel of influence. It is, uh, I based on information I have, they, they do have influence. Now, the, 
if, if we expand that, it is not only these three countries that you named, but it goes way beyond that. And there is a variety of different channels that a lot of regional uh, countries have been uh, utilizing, uh, promoting specific agenda and influence on the Taliban. Yeah, I'd agree with that assessment. Obviously, Pakistan holds the most leverage, but um, it's important to also kind of calculate um, who actually, which country holds the most most of the Taliban um, leadership's wealth, um, and that, and that country is the UAE. Uh, I, I think hands down. So um, I think it has a great deal of influence um, over um, what will happen next. Uh, it's not like you know, <laughs> it's not like the Taliban began sort of flying back and forth to Qatar. Um, you know, uh, you know, on flights out of Kabul. Uh, that's that's not how it's worked, right? Um, it, the, the relationship between the UAE uh, and the Taliban, and frankly, Pakistan, is a, sort of a, a three-way relationship. Um, and the UAE is the banker, really. At the at the end of the day, um, they're going to have a lot of leverage. Question for both of you: uh, We're getting a, a number of questions about Afghanistan's mineral wealth, which you know estimates will range up to a trillion dollars. Um, Is there, a, I mean, yeah, uh, it's been a long discussion about this issue for many years. I mean, uh, maybe Candice, you can begin and we'll, uh, we'll wrap up with Ambassador Rahmani in the four minutes we have left. But I mean, clearly Afghanistan is sitting on a gold mine of, of minerals, but getting them out is another issue, right? <laughs> you, have, you have to have a functioning government to get them out and actually like drive revenues. Um, and, you know, uh, that just hasn't occurred. And, you know, I get it, uh, you know, particularly the rare earths, we, you know, that's an enormous uh, national treasure for Afghanistan that could literally um, transform the country uh, into something, you know, on the scale of what we now see in South Korea, or, I mean, it would be an enormously transformative, uh, you know, moment if, if there was a functioning government that could get more than dribs of drabs uh, out of sort of artisanal mines uh, that are kind of scattered around um, out of Afghanistan, right? Um, I think there's also probably a question about China. I know there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, China's ambitions uh, in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, and now, you know, whether it can incorporate uh, Afghanistan into that framework. Um, you know, it hasn't been super successful, actually, even in Pakistan, right? There's a lot of security issues um, for Belt and Road Initiative uh, projects, in, in especially in southern Pakistan, um, you know, in the area bordering Afghanistan. So, um, and I, you know, there are some mining enterprises, of course, uh, that China has tried to um, get going, uh, especially with copper uh, in Afghanistan, um, and those have not really panned out either. Uh, and the reason is simply you just, you cannot move, um, you know, large goods and uh, large amounts of, you know, minerals across a country that is insecure, uh, and you cannot, um, you can't just sort of take them out um, with no market to deliver them to. Uh, so I, I think any, anybody who sort of has this idea that China will come in now in the next five years and, um, you know, take over the rare earths of Afghanistan is still living kind of in a, in a fantasy land. Ambassador Rahmani. Uh, like Candace said, you need a functional government to uh, exploit and extract these uh, natural wealth. However, uh, the, the, Irony and, and the problem is that they have been already exploited so much illegally in the absence of a, a functioning government, which is a lot more dangerous. We have uh, seen countries coming and looting the kind of minerals that they could. Copper probably would be a little more difficult because it requires a lot of um, bigger scale infrastructure. But then there are those that are not as heavy or would not require. And throughout the past 20 years before that, and uh, I'm worried that even more now, a lot of these natural wells of Afghanistan are completely in danger not only for illegal extraction, but also destruction, because as they are illegally mined, 
they usually destroy all the areas around it. And at the same time, uh, it is not efficiently done and, and probably leaves all sorts of residuals and things that are harmful. So this is in fact, one of the reasons that the international community must pay attention. Now we are where we are, it's messy, it is chaotic, what needs to be done? I think the ideal thing, scenario would be that there would be immediate peacekeeping mission deployed in Afghanistan uh, in order to just uh, ensure that, that uh, mass atrocities will not happen. Number two is uh, securing whatever assets Afghanistan has, whether it's inside Afghanistan or outside Afghanistan. I think international community has an obligation to prevent looting of Afghanistan once again. It is. It has happened. It, it is happening, and it would be uh, such a shame to to lose that. Uh, and thirdly, the uh, pre uh, preservation or protection of our uh, historic and cultural heritage that that uh, could be looted, and it is a loss for the entire humanity. But and fourth, but not in this order. But and most importantly. Uh, protecting uh, the rights of Afghan women, protecting women to begin with, because they are again, uh, those who will be losing the most and their rights is not simply uh, protection, the, the protection of women of Afghanistan and their rights is not just a moral and ethical issue. It is a ma matter of national security. It, it ties directly with the counterterrorism strategies and it ties with the uh, economic development and how what would be the course of economy. They are the one that are running the local markets. They are the one that are producing majority of the uh, agricultural products in Afghanistan, although it's unpaid, but that they are the ones that are producing it. Per, per, their protection would determine the course uh, that Afghanistan will be set to, as well as the stability of the region, whether extremism would find again a breathing ground leading to terrorism in Afghanistan or not. Well, thank you, Ambassador Rahmani, and thank you, Candice, uh, um, and uh, thank you for the 250 people or so who tuned in to listen to this. Um, and uh, we're just going to give, give both Candice and Ambassador Rakhmani a, a, a virtual applause uh, and we'll wind it up now. Thank you. <laughs>